Today, we're going to get things started off, as Ashley mentioned, with a discussion between leaders at the National Foundation of Educational Research, who will be diving into their industry, industry research and sharing how assessment trends have progressed. So a brief overview of the National Foundation of Educational Research, or NFER, is an independent, not-for-profit organization in England. Their mission is to generate evidence and insights that can be used to improve outcomes for future generations everywhere and to support positive change across education systems. Their long history of more than 75 years, vast experience in pioneering methods have established their reputation as an authoritative, trusted and respected voice in education. They use their expertise to produce high quality, independent research and insights to inform key decision makers about issues across the education system, including accountability, assessment, classroom practice, social mobility and school workforce. So Angela and Claire are both in the Center for Assessment within the research department at NFER, and they work with a team of more than 30 assessment researchers on a range of assessment development and capacity building projects for clients in the UK, as well as internationally. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Angela and Claire to you. We have Angela Hopkins, the Head of Assessment Services at NFER. She is responsible for overseeing contracted assessments and successfully bidding for new assessment projects with a range of national and international clients. She was previously a senior global recognition and accreditation manager at the International Baccalaureate. She has also spent many years at the qualifications and curriculum authority in roles ranging from regulation of secondary qualifications to development and delivery of national curriculum assessments. We also have Claire Hodgson with us today. Claire is a former primary school teacher who is now a research director with the responsibility for directing large scale assessment development projects. She directs projects across a range of subjects and for different age groups. And Claire has a considerable experience in leading and designing large scale assessment projects working for a range of clients. She is currently working on the delivery of an assessment for a staff a uh, statutory national rollout making use of e-assessment technology. And so without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Claire and Angela to share their insights and get started. Thank you very much, Samantha, shall we start? Right, good day everyone. And um, thank you very much for joining today. We are really pleased to be able to talk to you about current assessment trends. We know you are all aware of the importance of assessment. It gives us an opportunity to find out and recognize what a student has learned, what they can and can't do, and what further learning and development they might need. Assessments also provide useful information for stakeholders, such as teachers, governments, and the pupils themselves, so the assessment needs to have sufficient reliability and validity for the purpose for which it's being used. Assessments and qualification systems vary across the world. In this presentation, we'll discuss some of the current assessment trends that we have observed with an emphasis on assessments in primary and secondary schools, as this is a big focus of our work. We'll look at these trends in more detail as we go through the session. But Ashley, if you can move to the first next slide, I'll just give a brief overview. So we've identified four trends that regularly come up in dialogue about assessment. Firstly, um, not surprisingly, the use of technology to enable much greater flexibility and benefits than has been possible using traditional assessment methods of pen and paper. Technology is a very broad heading, and we have selected a few aspects to look at in more detail, which Claire will talk about shortly. Secondly, we note the move by some countries to put greater emphasis on formative or more personalised assessments, where the stakes are lower for schools and students. For example, rather than having a single point of opportunity test at the end of course, the desire is to move to more flexible arrangements, which focus on the individual learner's needs, with the intention of focusing on progress rather than summative outcomes. Thirdly, there is a desire to obtain reliable data from assessments that can be used to provide important insights for teachers, governments, donors, and all stakeholders that have a critical interest in improving the chances of young people. 
And finally, the desire to assess more than just knowledge has resulted in growing interest in non-cognitive skills, also referred to as life or 21st century skills. Increasingly, we see many stakeholder groups, including employers and parents, talk about the importance of young people developing wider skill sets that will prepare them for their long working lives, although they are very difficult to measure, as we will touch on later. So we're going to start off with technology, as that covers many different aspects, and I'm going to pass over to Claire now. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. If we could have the next slide, please. Okay, so kicking off with our first trend, technology. So this has clearly had a very significant role to play in education in the last um, few years. And this has resulted in accelerated progress as a result of the pandemic in terms of technology use in schools. Who would have thought at the turn of the century that it would be possible for students to be taught at home through online video conferencing? But looking more specifically at assessment, we will look at the benefits and drivers of moving to e-assessment and provide some examples of countries which have moved to digital systems in recent years. And within this theme, we're going to explore how e-assessment provides more opportunities for personalization and also consider the wider benefits of a move away from traditional assessment practices. For example, the impact on the environment and the possibility of extending assessment opportunities to developing countries. Next slide, please. So first of all, we just want to uh, look at the benefits of going to e-assessment. So we know that computer-based assessment or CBA can be used for a range of purposes, including diagnostic, formative and summative assessment, and it's growing in prominence. On-screen assessment allow for multimedia presentations, so for example, simulations and animations, and they can be useful um, to assess understanding of scientific concepts, for example. Assessments that contain multiple choice style or uh, closed questions can be marked automatically, and these reports um, can be generated about the pupils immediately. This helps to decrease teacher workload because there's no need to mark the pupils' answers, and it also means the pupils have less time to wait for their results. The possibility of computer adaptive testing, or CAT, can have further benefits on the pupils' experience. For example, the pupil is directed through a series of targeted questions, and this helps to ensure that they don't feel inadequate or bored by the assessment that they're taking. Similarly, a test comprising questions which are increasingly targeted at pupils' ability level will provide a greater degree of precision than a test that's designed for a much broader range of pupils. CBA can also be seen as acknowledgement of the role that screens play in our everyday lives of our children. And other advantages include the fact that it's greener, helping to reduce paper and delivery costs, and delivering online assessments can also help to build resilience. For example, as we've just been experiencing, finding ways to reduce or remove exam timetable disruptions resulting from the pandemic would be a good thing. Okay, next slide, please. So we wanted to have a little look at what's been happening in some countries that have already moved their assessments online. So Norway was one of the first countries in Europe in the early 2000s to implement e-assessment on a national scale. Standardised online assessments are used to test all pupils in reading, maths and some parts of the English language. And these are held in the autumn of each year for pupils in elementary and lower secondary schools. Denmark was also a relatively earlier adopter of online assessments, and since 2010, all national tests for primary and junior, junior secondary students have been completed online and are adaptive. The national test programme covers 10 standardised tests for grades two to eight, and they're an integral part of a larger schooling reform responding to recommendations made by the OECD following the PISA results in 2009. The tests are used for two main purposes, so at an individual level for teachers to feed back to their students and help to adapt their teaching plans, and secondly to inform national test monitoring at school and national levels. In the United States there are obviously various online assessments including the SAT and College Board digital assessments. One key assessment is the National Assessment of Educational Progress, and this is a nationally representative sample of students, around 300,000 of them, tested uh, each grade in each subject. The research into transitioning to the computer-based ass assessment version can be divided into three time periods starting in the early 2000s, and paper-based assessments were adapted for a computer-based administration. This was followed by a series of studies comparing paper-based and computer-based assessments, and the creation of additional items using innovative item types. 
The paper-based version will not be available after 2022, apart from for students that have specific needs. But it is worth noting that the paper-based and computer-based assessments aren't directly comparable because the computer-based assessment makes use of technology-enhanced item types. Moving to the last 10 years or so, there have been more countries moving to online assessment. So in the UK, where we are, for example, there are a number of approaches being followed. In Wales, there's an online personalised adaptive assessment in numeracy and reading, and these have replaced paper-based assessments in recent years for all pupils in primary and lower secondary schools. There's no test window for these assessments and the stakes are not attached to the results, but pupils are required to take them at least once during the year. In Scotland, they've introduced computer-based assessments for their national primary and secondary assessments since 2017. And these are standardised assessments designed to adapt to each child's answers. Data is used for formative purposes to support uh, in-class teaching, and the data is also used for summative evaluations. The first national assessment containing computer-based assessment in England uh, was the on-screen multiplication tables check, which was rolled out to all primary schools in 2020. This is uh, an assessment that children take themselves online. But this year also saw the introduction of the reception baseline assessment, and this is an assessment for children on their entry to school. Although this doesn't require the children to take the test online themselves, the assessment is delivered by the teacher in a one-to-one -one scenario, and they have a script and record the answers on a tablet or a laptop. The assessment itself is adaptive, meaning the child is routed through the assessment appropriate to what they can do. Moving to the other side of the world in Australia, the National Assessment Programme Literacy and Numeracy, or NAPLAN, is an assessment uh, taken annually in May for students in particular year groups at both primary and secondary ages. And it samples approximately 310,000 pupils. Each administration measures the attainment of three cohorts of students and schools against national standards for use at the national, school and individual level. It's made up of tests in reading, writing, conventions of language and numeracy, and has been an annual assessment since 2008, but it's been transitioning to an online version and has followed a phased introduction. Decisions on exact dates and uh, for transition to the computer-based version were devolved to the education boards of individual states and territories. And the first administration of the computer-based version took place in a minority of schools in 2018. However, the proportion of schools administering the computer-based version has increased since then. And all schools are expected to have transitioned from the paper version to the online version by 2022. Um, and as we've said for the um, United States, it's worth noting that the paper-based and computer-based versions are not directly comparable because of the now introduced use of adaptive testing and technologically enhanced item types. Over in New Zealand, the Ministry of Education is currently carrying out a five-year programme to refresh the New Zealand curriculum. And about eight years ago, work started looking at digitising assessments for secondary students, and the first uh, trials and pilots took place in 2016. Key to this approach has been New Zealand's government providing additional technology and infrastructure and connectivity that allows for a level playing field across schools. Schools have had the opportunity to opt in to the on-screen assessment as new subjects have come online. And the point of the curriculum for reform in New Zealand is being seen as an opportunity to design content that's digital first, content designed to be assessed on screen rather than just digitising content that's already been designed on paper. So what's interesting across all these countries that they've adopted or are well on their way to adopting online testing is the variety of year groups, subjects and their approach. The purpose for assessment also varies between countries from those using them for formative and diagnostic purposes in class to those using them for accountability measures. Okay, next screen please. Okay, so of course we've also, sorry, it was the previous one, just looked very similar, <laughs> thank you. So of course we've also got uh, assessment um, systems, other assessment systems going on, uh, such as the international programmes like the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Programme and also the compar comparison studies of um, PISA and TIMS and PEARLS. And we anticipate that the use of student assessment data for system and workforce improvement and policy making will increase. There's also some evidence that developing countries will want to devise their own assessment systems, perhaps adapting existing systems such as the EGRA, EGMA um, to reflect their country's own curriculum and cultural perspective, and also to support increased buy-in. 
A range of approaches are underway regarding the move to e-assessment, with some countries choosing to build their own platform and others preferring to buy a mature system. There are also different approaches to the move to e-assessment, with some countries adopting a transition from paper to e, which might involve converting items or whole tests, while others are choosing to create new assessments from scratch within the e-environment. Okay, next screen, please. So some of the considerations before moving to E, there's obviously the initial expense and setup costs are very high and require a huge amount of testing and trialing in the initial stages. So this requires money, time and commitment from all the key stakeholders. There's also the consideration of how the on-screen testing will fit into the wider assessment policy and whether it really is the most effective assessment tool. Validity of assessment, so for example, can the chosen subject be adequately tested via the on-screen environment? and will it produce the results that you want for the particular pupils, they're also a key um, assessment consideration. Pupil familiarity with devices also needs to be considered, although we would expect there to be, um, you know, continuing increased proficiency uh, amongst pupils, and that's the way we need to look going forwards. There's also the logistical considerations, so whether we have the availability of sufficient computer equipment that's in working order with the appropriate hardware and software, and also sufficient internet access, so you've got good enough broadband coverage and reliable coverage that would be secure. Accessibility issues are another consideration, and we've got opportunities and challenges here. So use of screen readers and headphones will obviously help to provide a more positive experience than paper-based um, assessments, but accommodations are a factor that need to be considered during the development process. Okay, next slide, please. Think about the drivers towards e-assessment. COVID has um, provided us with a very clear gear shift. So access and um, greater ability to get online to deliver teaching and learning might have now raised the expectation that assessment should follow suit. And there's also the uh, acknowledgement of the role that screens play in children's everyday lives. There's the desire to keep up with other countries who are already ahead of the game with their online assessments and a requirement to make assessments suitable for all age groups. So currently very young children tend not to be catered for in this, in this field. There's the possibility of greater innovation in question types. So as we've spoken about simulations and VR provide opportunities to assess things that can't easily be assessed in other scenarios. So for example, science practicals or looking at potentially dangerous scenarios. As we've mentioned with the key drivers is to look at ways of reducing the burden on teachers looking to the long term to save money and time and also being able to provide feedback to pupils. The advantages of personalised assessment um, can be provided through computer adaptive testing and this can help to improve pupils experience with much more targeted questioning, um, reduction in test length and also allows for greater precision. We've also got the um, consideration of delivery and logistical issues. So a desire to be greener and reducing our carbon footprint and desire to use paper and pen methods. Having the option of a variety of different testing locations and timings that can be much more flexible. Making use of remote invigilation and proctoring. Um, and as the devices get cheaper and Wi-Fi provision improves, it means that there should be greater accessibility to assessments around the world. And next one, please. So to counter our drivers, we've also got a number of barriers and I've picked up some of these already when I talked about the associated costs and the need to set up a necessary, the appropriate infrastructure. However, there are other barriers that might include things such as equity and inclusion. So adoption of a fully digitized system could raise issues of inclusion if some learners aren't able to access fully what those opportunities might be. The move to bring your own devices also exacerbates the gaps between economic groups rather than improve them. And related to this is whether or not schools are even equipped to deliver the online assessments. They need to consider the number of suitable devices available, and that would determine how many pupils can take assessments simultaneously. Another barrier relates to digital literacy, and this refers to the preparedness of pupils and teachers for on-screen assessment. We might assume that the current generation of students are all digital natives, and their familiarity with technology in everyday life means that they should be capable and confident with using an on-screen assessment. However, whilst they may be used to using a smartphone or a tablet, this might be different set of skills to what they might need in an online test where they might need to be able to do typing, for example. Digital literacy also refers to the needs of the staff 
and it can be a challenge for a national rollout of an on-screen assessment that teachers and IT support staff would need upskilling and training to ensure that there's a consistent delivery across the country. And again, this would have cost and time implications. Finally, increased use of on-screen assessment could theoretically pose new or different risks of malpractice. Ultimately, the nature of evolving malpractice risk arising from much greater on-screen use will depend on how on-screen assessment is deployed. So for example, adopting a bring your own device approach with a downloadable but offline assessment will require different steps to malpractice compared with an online assessment that's taken in a centre center itself or making use of proctoring. Next slide, please. Thank you, Claire. Right, we're going to move on now to the second trend we have identified on more personalised learning. And the idea of putting the learner up front and central may not seem new. Um, I suspect we would all say that this is what we aim to do. However, this is a mixture of a current trend and a desire. It's what many are working towards, but we are not necessarily there yet. This is about putting the learner and the learning front and central within the context of assessment being needed for various purposes. There is more discussion about the need for adaptive assessments and formative assessments that provide feedback. And there is the desire for assessments to be less obtrusive and more learning focused. As we've seen, there is evidence for this in the countries such as New Zealand, Australia, Scotland and Wales, where there is a shift to online adaptive testing. We are also seeing an interest in open book arrangements for senior secondary qualifications. Until recently, this was a practice that is well established in vocational and professional exams for adult candidates, but hasn't been used so much in, in um, school based assessments. And again, this reflects a move away from not just testing memory and putting greater focus on the application of knowledge. Computer adaptive testing makes the experience more bespoke for the learner and improves their experience. As Claire mentioned, the possibility of computer adaptive testing can have further benefits on the pupil's experience. For example, the test length can be reduced as the use of targeted questions will enable stakeholders to make inferences about the learner's knowledge and their understanding of the curriculum based on a much smaller number of questions than is needed for a traditional linear test, which has to cover all abilities. And as we mentioned, an assessment targeted at, pupil, uh, at pupils' ability level will provide a greater degree of precision than a test designed for pupils of all abilities. We can move on our slide, please, Ashley. So we're going to move now on to our third trend, which is on non-cognitive skills. Now, we accept that the focus of assessment in many countries and states will continue to be on literacy and numeracy. However, in recent years, research and interest in non-cognitive skills has increased. So firstly, what do we mean by the term non-cognitive skills? Um, well, it's important to recognise that they are known by many different names, such as life skills, soft skills, 21st century skills, socio-emotional skills, character skills, etc. And in terms of what they are, they're usually deemed to be typically to be transferable skills, usually covering skills, attitudes, values and behaviours. They include skills such as empathy, communication, resilience, problem solving, collaboration, participation, etc. I.e. those skills you need alongside your academic knowledge in order to deal with everyday life. Non-cognitive skills are thought to improve well-being, academic success and employability. They can be learned throughout life, obviously though it is believed by some that there are optimal ages when interventions targeting specific skills are most likely to be effective. Can I move slide, please? So let's look a bit about the importance of non-cognitive skills. The recent developments that we've seen indicate that governments and international organizations are attaching more importance to non-cognitive skills. Examples of this include the publication of the Character Education Framework in England. It's non-statutory, but it represents a step forward in acknowledging the importance attached to this area. 
Similarly, the Council of the European Union adopted a recommendation on key competences for lifelong learning in May 2018. This identifies eight key competences essential to citizens. It covers knowledge and digital competence, but also underlying skills such as personal, social and learning to learn competence and citizenship. Another big development we're aware of is UNICEF's um, Middle East and North Africa, no, referred to as MENA, um, their Life Skills and Citizenship Education Initiative, also known as the LSCE, which started in 2015 with the aim of supporting countries in the region to improve learning and to better invest such learning in individual social and economic development. And finally, as a result of the pandemic, there has been an increased discussion about life skills, and there have been concerns that social skills have suffered. And this is for everyone, um, not just young people, as a result of the enforced changes in lifestyle. It has also galvanized discussion about the importance of resilience as a life skill and how best to teach it. Moving on. So finally, on this topic, we're going to talk a bit about the measurement of life skills. In light of the growing importance of non-cognitive skills, with some countries and states moving to embed them in their education system, there is also growing interest in measuring them, as governments and investors want to know how effective their teaching and learning has been, and also to learn from it and to support teaching and learning going forward. It's worth also noting that employers are very vocal in wanting to see their future employees have higher level non-cognitive skills in areas such as problem solving and social skills. They are also very mindful of the need to identify the essential employment skills that people will need for work in the future and to prepare accordingly. Other interest groups such as parents and head teachers also believe that these skills should be taught alongside academic subjects. Not surprisingly, the measurement of non-cognitive skills is complex, with no real consensus in the field about the best way to measure them or whether these are, in fact, measurable constructs. Validity is a key concern in non-cognitive assessment, i.e. whether you are authentically measuring what you set out to measure. Take a skill like communication. You really need a face-to-face -face situation or maybe a computer simulation if you want to have any chance of assessing interaction and collaboration, but this is expensive and it still may not be fully authentic. One of the main ways of measuring non-cognitive skills to date are through self-report assessments, and there are many such self-reports being used today. They are quick and flexible to deliver to test takers, and they're also quite good to analyze, but they have issues such as social desirability bias, i.e. is the responder saying what you want to hear rather than the truly honest answer. There are also concerns that they do not involve demonstration of the skill and they could be proxies for reading and reasoning skills. Cultural issues are another concern. Situational judgment tasks are also used to assess people's judgments in given situations. Computer-based assessments can also offer alternative ways to assess certain uncog skills, e.g. through games and tasks. So in conclusion, we expect to see more interest in non-cognitive skills and more time in looking at effective ways of measuring them, although there is a long way to go. Moving, finally, we're going to move to our trend four on data. So if we can move the slide on. So the collection and use of assessment data is not new in itself. However, there is a growing awareness of the need for reliable evidence of student outcomes to measure the impact of in interventions and investments and to inform system-wide improvements. We make three observations here about trends to watch. Um, as we know, methodical analysis of assessment data provides the evidence teachers need to improve teaching and learning for students, both at class and individual level. To make best use of assessments, teachers need to be confident in using assessment data. Research suggests, however, that a proportion of teacher requ teachers require support to use learner responses effectively, to interpret misconceptions and to formulate next steps. There have also been concerns that some assessments fail to provide the type and format of data required to helpfully inform student learning needs. 
And similarly, gathering too much data without a clear understanding of how to use it has also had a ne negative backwash on student and teacher experiences. It is therefore very important that time is invested in improving teacher assessment literacy and supporting them in understanding the principles of valid and reliable assessment measures. It is an issue which is becoming increasingly to the surface, and we expect to see governments and commissioners across the globe investing in building the capacity of their teacher work, teaching workforce in using assessments and associated data more effectively. Similarly, whilst countries and regions can, around the world continue to adopt a range of different assessment models for their young people, be it high stakes assessments used for accountability, to the more flexible arrangements that Claire mentioned. It is increasingly recognised that any exam or assessment must have a clearly defined purpose and the design of that assessment must be the most suitable for achieving those purposes. It's also important to, that the assessment serves the needs of the test taker, whether it's a quick end of test topic set by the teacher or a formal end of phase qualification. Perhaps one of the many positive side effects of the General Data Protection Regulation legislation introduced in 2018 is the requirements of data owners and controllers to clearly establish their purposes for processing and data. And this must be clearly communicated to individuals through a privacy notice. Plus, this must be followed closely, limiting the processes of data to only the stated purposes. Moving on my slides, please. Another area where the collection of data is increasingly important is in relation to demonstrating progress in meeting the well-established global agendas for improving educational performance of children in developing countries. Initiatives such as the Sustainable Development Goals include specific targets such as SDG4 relating to the completion of quality primary and secondary education, leading to a relevant and effective learning outcome by 2030. Indicator 4.1.1 of SDG4 focuses on the proportion of young people achieving at least a minimum proficiency level in reading and mathematics at key points in their primary and secondary education. Now, whilst there have been positive advances in the proportion of young people actually attending school, the percentage of, of young people who do not meet the literacy and numeracy targets are still very high. As of 2021, over half of young people worldwide cannot read for meaning by the age of 10. And this is a situation that has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Without intervention and monitoring, there is unlikely to be a significant change in, in the percentage of students reaching the SDG benchmarks. We would expect use of student assessment data for system and workforce improvements and policy making to increase. Moving from a base where only a very small percentage of low and middle income countries use a reliable and learning assessment data to measure progress and identify support needed, to one in which data systems incorporate quality, formative and summative learning assessments. It's also worth noting the interest by commissioners and donors in the development of the item banks, comprising valid and reliable assessment instruments and tools to support countries devise their own assessments and also improve their own assessment literacy. This is a this trend we very much expect to continue. I'm moving on my slide. I haven't got much longer, so I'm just aware of time. Um, finally, we're going to look at big data. It's worth mentioning the very exciting possibilities afforded by big data sets. As the devices get smaller, the volume of data gets larger. And researchers and policymakers are becoming increasingly aware of the changing horizons. Until now, it's been usual practice to focus on only on the endpoint of the assessment, and commentators have expressed concerns about the limited use of short-term metrics like exam results to measure success or to make judgments about young people. Now, the collection of long, longitudinal large longitudinal data sets such as national test results and data on young people's activities and earnings over a period of time have the power to provide highly informative insights into young people's longer term prospects and trajectories. Data sets can be linked in ways that was not possible before, for example, enabling researchers to investigate the relevance and impacts of young people's educational context and their learning assessment outcomes on their later lives. Information about longer term outcomes could give schools a much better understanding what their learners go on to do. 
Most importantly, it could help them to identify, reflect on and address strengths and challenges in their practice. This might include fresh approaches to teaching and learning, new curricula, improved careers provision and targeted learning support. So now education is a part of the engine rather than being the endpoint itself. So in conclusion, if we can go to the final slide, our experiences working in the field of assessment is that the demand for good quality assessment will continue. Views about what constitutes a good assessment system will vary around the world and within the each country. But there does appear to be consensus that assessments need to have clear purposes and need to be designed to be able to meet that purpose. As we've mentioned, it's increasingly important that key players in the system, such as teachers, school leaders, government officials, need to have high levels of assessment literacy in order to use assessments and the outcomes data effectively. We also see a greater move to sharing good practice in assessments and also assessment development practices through the growth of the global assessment community. The availability of open source materials, freely available research, and often comprehensive documents on governments and educational bodies web websites um, supports this move to much greater sharing. Technology obviously affords much greater access to these materials and the experience of the pandemic has shown just how much we can achieve without traveling thousands of miles to get it. We look forward to assessment continuing to have a positive impact on young people's lives. And I think that now brings us to the end. We've got a final slide with our names and contact details on. Um, I realize we are a little bit out of time, I um, but we do, I don't know whether we have time for a few questions. Claire and I would like to say we are very much open to dealing with any queries after this event. So please do email us. Thank you so much, Claire and Angela. This is a really great discussion. I think we all learned a lot from hearing some of these trends that you're seeing. Um, and we do have a few questions coming through the chat. Uh, so the first one that we have is, uh, do you think that the greater availability of online assessments would have reduced the disruption caused by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Um, we, we certainly think that with the knowledge we have now, that um, if digital systems were more established, it might have been possible to rather than to cancel exams, which is what happened in many countries in the world as a result of the pandemic, and have to use um, suddenly rapidly put together teacher assessment arrangements, that it, it would have been possible to have one externally assessed element component, perhaps not the full exam, but there might have been the, the means of being able to do an external assessment, which could have been used to moderate the teacher assessment so it would have been useful. Um, remote invigilation is a possibility that Claire mentioned. And obviously I think we're gonna see growing interest in that. We know it gets used for um, professional qualifications often. Um, I think if it's if it's managed, if it could be made manageable and there was trust in it, um, we will probably, yes, the, op the answer is we could see, it could have made things easier. Thank you. And um, we have another question from Andre Young. Um, this is posed to the both of you. How do we build trust into the assessment ecosystems of the world and how can we leverage assessment to heal the curiosity of learners? Um, just quick. This um, just quick um, thought about this. I think we can build trust by obviously developing, as I mentioned so often, that assessment development needs to be good. There needs to be clear, um, purposes of assessments need to be clear. They need to, frameworks need to be put in place. Um, and the assessments need to be fit for their purpose. Now, assessments can be used in a variety of ways, but they should be, if they're wanting to provide, say, data on a whole cohort or on a national cohort, they do need to have very high levels of validity and reliability um, with also greater emphasis on the reliability. 
if they're used for more formative purposes, then they need to be suitable for, for meeting those needs as well. Um, obviously, perhaps more on the validity of those assessments and using them in timely and appropriate ways and giving feedback to the student. Um, I think, as I said, it's clear also important to be transparent about what you're trying to do with the assessments so that all stakeholders have access to it. Um, and I, I think it's also about ensuring that we can, as I mentioned about ensuring that we have good assessments around the world and we build that capability and that capacity. Um, so I don't know whether Claire wants to add anything to that point or whether Andre has any follow up questions. Um, I think we have another question from the audience. Of course, I don't want to cut you off, Claire, if you have anything to add that um, to that point as well. Um, please feel free to jump in. Uh, but and one final question from the audience as well is how do you think online assessments or the use of technology could be best used for assessing non-cognitive skills? Do you want to answer, Sarah? It's Claire. Yeah, I was going to say, shall I make a start on this one? So yeah. um, we spoke really about the possibility of simulations or kind of having real life scenarios that could be presented online um, that can then be used as kind of a context that students can talk about in their responses um, in those sorts of environments. But there's also the kind of the possibility of data collection is easier when we've got technology to support us. So that also helps to support the uh, the direction that that is going and to help to kind of analyze the data that's coming through from any analysis or any assessments that are being carried out in that area. I don't know, Andrew, if you've got anything to add? No, I think that's good. Great. And then just a follow up from Andre, who's saying, yes, please, curiosity, um, healing for learning. We seem to have used assessment to shut down curiosity. Yeah, I know this is a point that comes up in regular forums of, of this type. Um, we need to get, I mean, obviously the balance of assessment needs to be right. And as Claire was saying in her slides, there are countries, some countries are taking different approaches because they are concerned that whether you have, if you have sort of um, quite formal assessment systems or assessment used for accountability, it can result in too much emphasis on the assessment. Um, and therefore it stops that curiosity. Um, I think obviously perhaps getting it, having proportionate assessment um, in terms of the high stakes and also having more formative assessment and more dialogue with the student um, is clearly going to be helpful to perhaps putting more focus back on the student as, as we mentioned. And perhaps if we have computer adaptive testing, we could afford to have less testing, uh, much shorter tests and, and much more, you know, more flexible arrangements so that there is more time for the, the curriculum. Um, and perhaps using more engaging materials. We, you know, there is a wealth of things that we're gonna be able to do with online assessment and perhaps assessment that where students quizzes and um, other scenarios or simulations where students will be lots, much less aware that they are being assessed and can enjoy and hopefully, um, you know, fulfill their curiosity. It will be stimulated and not closed down. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And um, I think that's all the time we have for questions today. I wanna thank you both for taking the time to uh, join our presentation, share your insights with the audience. It's been a great session and we look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you very much.